What's up, everybody? Big news. We are rebranding the podcast, changing the name from the Gospel of Fire to the Blueprint. Um, the podcast has shifted more to about uh, overcoming and more uh, overcoming obstacles and things like that, stepping into the fire, and more about to exactly what a blueprint means, okay? The, the foundation and the, and the structure for how it is that we go about our lives, and that's what a blueprint is, and that's what the podcast is really about. Talking to different people and different individuals and hearing their stories and then how they have built their lives, the actual tangible skills of how they make the things work, make uh, their things work for their life. So uh, October 3rd, that first Monday in October, uh, we will be shifting the name of the podcast from the Gospel of Fire to the Blueprint. So be on the lookout. Nothing else changes. Uh, everything stays the same. But there we go. What's up, my ninjas? This is former UFC fighter Elliot Marshall, and this is the Gospel of Fire, where we are going to learn how to go into the fire so that we can find our power and live the best life possible. This episode of the podcast is with Katie Stoddard. Katie, uh, this was a different one. She actually hit me up on Instagram to see if she could come on the show, which is not normally the way it goes for me. I don't uh, typically have a big enough podcast um, for that to happen, but it did in this case. So uh, I accepted. I was very excited to talk to her. She is a performance, uh, self-discipline, and focus coach, author, all of these things. And uh, it was really great to hear how clearly her ideas were laid out. She really understood and believed and, and, and could uh, relay the information of what she was saying. Uh, and that was a really, really great conversation. So without further ado, here we go. Katie Stoddard. Hi, Katie. How are you? Fantastic. Thank you so much for having me on the show today. Yeah, of course. This is a new. Uh, this is one that doesn't happen for me very often. Uh, you hit me up, or or somebody from your team hit me up on Instagram. Um, was it you personally, or was it somebody from your team? Yeah, it was me personally because I okay. saw that you interviewed Giovanni Deansman, and I thought, wow, that looks like a cool podcast. And then I reached out to you. There we go. All right, so that's how this happened. And uh, yeah, so I always ask the question normally at the end of the podcast. So we're kind of I won't ask this question at the end of why in the world somebody would uh, come on my show because uh, you'll get like very little publicity from this. Um, it's not like a major podcast or, or anything like that. Or, you know, uh, are you an author? I think you're an author, right? You've, uh, no. Or a coach. I'm uh, looking for a literary agent, actually. So <laughs> okay. I'm about to be author. You're not going to sign it. You're not going to, you might sell like a book because of this podcast. So uh, what made you, so you heard my podcast with Giovanni, right? Um, what was interesting about you? What made you go, oh, I'd like to do that? Well, first of all, I enjoy most podcast interviews, and I also like to speak with different people in that sphere. And I like the title. I was like, Gospel oh. of Fire. It sounded dynamic. It sounded <clears throat> enthusiastic. Uh, I'm and just about to change it, too. I'm about really? to rebrand. Really? Well, you change yeah. it, too. Well, the maybe it's even better. Yeah, The Blueprint. The Blueprint. I don't know. I like fire. Okay. But fire and blue are very different images, right? Blue is called fire's hot. <laughs> but it's like a contrast. It's good, too. <clears throat> Yeah, I get so the gospel fire. I guess what I get a lot of with it is people think it's religious and it's not religious, you know. So it can it can have that confusion. Um, so yeah, I'm about to rebrand it too. So damn it, somebody's coming on because of the name, <laughs> not because of it. That was one thing that looked nice. Yeah. And then I checked your profile on LinkedIn, and then I thought it was interesting. And then it then and then All right. that's how. Well, this podcast is not about me. It's about you. Uh, what do you do? I run a learning and development company. So essentially, I provide workshops and coaching on the topics of focus and discipline. If we really narrow it down, because I'm <clears> trying <throat> to say it as briefly as possible, that would be my brief, brief version. Mm, discipline so hard for people. Yes. Go ahead. What do you call discipline? What do I call discipline? Yeah. Do you have a definition for discipline? Like what, what is discipline to you? 
Yes, well, a lot of my content has been inspired directly by Giovanni Dinsman because we work together. And so okay. I've gotten a lot of uh, his inspiration, which is that self-discipline and his version is mindful self-discipline. So my version too. <laughs> and that's about living life according to your values and goals. I think the reason it's so hard is because our brain is wired for that instant gratification. It's wired for short-term pleasure and reward. And so we're not actually made, like neurologically speaking, to seek these long-term goals and take these steps towards it. We're made for survival, doing those things. Well, it's not totally true what I was saying. We're not made, like <coughs> our amygdala and reptilian brain is made for the survival, but it's true that the neocortex does, but then it's about developing that part of the brain more. Yeah, it's hard not to, uh, I don't know, I call it squirreling, right? You're like, oh, squirrel, squirrel, you know, like you're just like looking all over the place for the next thing that like pops in front of your, in your, in front of your, uh, your, your worldview or your view of the world. So um, mindful self-discipline, I hope we heard Giovanni talk about it. What is it to you? And, yes, and just, re so, just readdress it just in case nobody listened to that interview. Because I, like I said, nobody listens to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so mindful self-discipline, like I was saying, is living according to your values and goals. But it's also that choice that we have every single moment to do something that feels aligned or to do something that's a quick fix, a quick reward, uh, something that we feel pulled by because we're tired or because it's what we feel like doing in the moment. <clears throat> and so having that self-discipline is being able to, on the moment, step away from that temptation and do what actually deep down feels right and is aligned now that doesn't mean <laughs> that you can you know never eat whatever or never go on instagram or never do any of those things it's more about really being intentional when you do it so if you're in the middle of a really important project or task or writing a book then you know is it really the right moment to start scrolling social media and so having that discipline in the moment to step back into your book to stay into the book and not just get distracted and do something else, which is directly correlated to focus, which is why I love Giovanni's work so much and collaborated because all of my work until then was all around focus. So yes. Makes sense. Um, you talked about values. How does somebody come up with their values? Because I think this is a very hard thing. Like uh, everybody, you know, you're not in America, you're in Sweden. So, uh, I don't know how it is over there, but you have a lot of people screaming about values over here, you know, and, and what are American values and yada, yada. And uh, that's really great when you just say the word, but what are they and how do people come up with them? Yeah, that's such a good question. And I think this is a huge part of the work. So, of course, to be aligned with your values and your goals, you need to know what your values what they and your are. goals are. <laughs> exactly. So there are different ways to, to find out what they are. First of all, is looking at things that trigger you. So if, for example, when someone's dishonest or lies, you get really triggered more than other things, then maybe honesty is one of your core values. So looking at the things that trigger you, or the things that drive you. So for example, you said that you have the these two quotes behind you that drive all of your behavior. Maybe each one corresponds to a key value. Maybe, you know, the one about hate cannot be driven out by hate, but it's through love. Maybe there's something around love or around respect or around compassion that's one of your core values. So it's looking at what is driving all your behavior. The thing is, we have values, all of us, but sometimes we just don't know what they are. There's already something driving our behavior, driving our thought patterns, making us feel triggered. It's just, we need to uncover it. So it's looking at what triggers you in the sort of pain side, what drives you in the love side, what resonates with you. So if there's other people, <clears throat> when you're speaking to them and you feel such a resonance, maybe you have similar values, right? <laughs> so if you start asking them what's the value, then you might feel aligned. So with Giovanni, for example, I know one of his values is around power, for instance, and I really believe it's important to be empowered and confident. And so that was sort of a link. Mine was more integrity, but the similarities in values. And generally the people we really like and connect with is because we've got similar ish values or at least one or two in common and people where we really struggle is because there's a misalignment of value so let's say someone who's super honest and believes in justice and honesty and doing the right thing and someone who thinks it's just smart to bend the rules 
find a different path, do exceptions, really rebellious, they're probably going to struggle. <laughs> you know, there's probably going to be a few conversations where they struggle. Don't you think most people think that honesty is their value, though? No, I don't think so. I think some people think really? it's a nice value, but I don't think that's what people always think of as their value. Some people think it's smart to do it a different way. They might not think of themselves, quote unquote, as dishonest. Right. So that's what I'm saying, though. No one walks around the world going, you know what? I'm a dishonest motherfucker. <laughs> Like not they even Donald wouldn't Trump. Say that, but they probably think they're small or they bend the rules or they're rebellious. <clears throat> some people like the term rebellious, you know. So it's uh it's different. But anyway, those are some of the ways you can find your values, seeing who you resonate with and what their values are, seeing what drives your behavior, what things really inspire you, like these quotes, what triggers you and feels off, looking at these sources of inspiration, and yeah, just looking through a list of words picking the ones that resonate most and then test driving those values over a few weeks. Seeing if it I think fits. sometimes that's a good point is people uh, that you, what you just said, test driving, because people just like, write Like you go, okay, these are my values. And then uh, you, you test drive them and it's a shitty car, right? You're like, <laughs> Oh man, I do not like how this car rides. And, and then, but you're so afraid to come off of them because you said it's your value. Right. Uh, and I think the test driving is a really important piece how do you test drive it? You try to apply it as much as possible. And if it already is your value, you'll be doing it naturally. So for example, one of my values is curiosity. Well, it's pretty easy to see that it's always there. I'm super curious about meeting new people. Every time there's a new sort of event, I want to go to it. Every time there's a new hobby, I want to try it. Every So I'm big on, on variety, change, and <coughs> curiosity. I'm curious about a book. You mentioned a book, suddenly I'll be curious and I'll want to look it up. So I can feel it in my behavior. Now, if I was unsure, let's say that curiosity was one of my values and I was test driving it, then I'd probably think what would be a curious uh, action for me to do right now? What would be an action driven by curiosity? Oh, I'd reach out to this person. Oh, I did. And then you see, is this something you would naturally do and it feels quite aligned? Or is it sort of a bit of an effort? In which case it's fine. You're practicing curiosity. It's a great skill to have. It's a great action to work on but it might not be one of your core values. Uh, same with, let's say, something like compassion. Let's say you want to work on being more compassionate and you test drive compassion, then you'll act towards people and towards yourself with more compassion and you'll see, oh, this is something I do naturally anyway, or, ah, oh, actually, this is kind of an effort. Great to have this virtue that you're working on, but it might not be one of your core values. There's sort of a distinction between the virtues you want to improve and the core values that are sort of already there. There's something about writing them down as well, or like, like putting, uh, even if you don't write them down, stating them, however you want to say this, that really makes you kind of step into them as well. Right. Because, uh, like I was saying a second ago, you, you hear a lot about like, Oh, American values, you, whatever my, my values, but no one's ever stated it. No one's ever written it down. What, what, what does that mean? And, there's something that happens in that process. What do you think that is that happens to you in the process of once you've written them down that you really start to step into those values? I think it's similar to, to the goals, you know, writing down the goals. I think that there's something around commitment when we write it down because it's always really different to have something in our mind or just talk about it. And once you sort of put it on paper or put it in a document or put it on your website, then it feels official. Then it feels like it's real. And I feel that, Although we already have these values and they're probably already dictating a lot of our behavior, once we're more clear about it, it's sort of like we can enhance it. So let's say one of your values is love or compassion based on the quote behind. You might already do this. You might already know and act in that way. But knowing really that it's your value, writing it down, it'll be sort of an ongoing reminder, right? This is one of the most important things for me. This is how I want to act and react and behave in everyday life, which comes back to self-discipline <laughs> because yeah. then when someone ticks you off in the supermarket and you know, wait, <clears throat> one of my values is compassion or love or whatever you want to call it, and you respond with kindness, you're being disciplined and not just snapping back because you're following your value. What do you do when, uh, as we all do, right? Uh, we break them sometimes, right? Or not, not break them. We, we misstep. We, we step out of our value. Uh, we show uh, maybe a lack of discipline and sticking with the value, whatever it is, but we, but we do know it's a value, right? Like 
Um, let's say mine is love and compassion, for example. There's going to be a time when I yell at somebody, right? When, when I don't show it, how, how do we get back aligned and how do we step back into it? Self-compassion. So just realizing, okay, we're human. Maybe, you know, it happened. Try not to excuse ourselves for it, but not feel guilty either. Excuse ourselves doesn't help because we know it's not true. <laughs> so mm -hmm, if we say mm -hmm. something, oh, I had a hard day, et cetera, you could still be nice even if you had a hard day. And you're not buying it yourself when you say that. So <clears throat> no excuse, but no super girl. Oh my God, it was terrible. Why did I snap all of that? Just being like, all right, misstepped. If you can, you apologize. If you can't, let's say it's someone in the street you'll never see again. You just sort of do a mini in a peace moment. Sorry about that. Didn't mean snap. Breathe next day because i think the more energy we waste like overthinking and feeling guilty etc the more we're likely to then snap at our friends when we see them because we're still annoyed that we snapped at that first person and it's just sort of this vicious circle so the the faster we can step away from that guilt uh, and also from the excuses because they're not useful and just see it for what it is accept it show a bit of compassion for yourself the person in question if if you offended someone in, in that circumstance and then just Right, this happened. <sighs> Breathe, move on. A bit like any time we screw up, right? A bit mm -hmm. like the time you skip your morning routine or the time you, whatever you do, that you think, man, that wasn't real. That kind of sucks. Oh, well. <sighs> Breathe, move on. Set intention. Yeah. Compassion and set an intention for moving forward. Relate all of this to productivity because that's your thing, right? Productivity and leadership and all of that. So now take, combine these values and discipline and focus. And now go ahead, take it. How, how do you take people to now being more productive and really stepping into who they are and, and uh, getting things done? Nice. Well, my main definition around <laughs> productivity and high performance, peak performance, is that ability to manage your attention, your energy, and your time in the way that's most aligned. So here's how they're directly correlated, because we're saying that discipline is the ability to take action according to your values and your goals. Now, productivity, according to my definition, is the ability to use your time, energy, and attention according to your values and your goals. So really, it's about living life in an aligned and intentional way, because I feel that nowadays a lot of people are on autopilot, a lot of people are distracted, and they're stepping away from living the life that they could if they just pause, reflected on their values and goals, and lived with that intention. And once you have that clear intention, then it can help you to navigate what to focus on. So master your attention, then ensure that you have the energy that you need to achieve your goals. So working on all the things that you can do to boost <clears throat> your energy. And then obviously there's a lot in time management yeah. and in productivity of mastering your time. But I feel it's so much easier once you have the clarity on your vision, your aspirations, and you break it down into goals then it's a lot easier to manage your time because suddenly at least you're clear where you're going. And then it's just a mat matter of a few little tricks, you know, right? Yeah, time blocking, breaks, priorities, most important tasks, Pomodoro, Pox Law, all that stuff. Read a couple right. of books, listen to a few podcasts and you've got it. <laughs> I think a lot of, I think the biggest part is people don't know where they're going. I think they have these goals that aren't aligned with their life, right? They're like, oh, I want this. Uh, I want to, I want to be a billionaire and, uh, I teach school and there's no, there's nothing wrong with being a billionaire and there's nothing wrong with teaching school. They just don't line up, <laughs> right? Like, like, like what you're doing with where you say you want to go have nothing to do with each other. And again, nothing wrong with doing either one, but teaching school ain't going to get you to be a billionaire. So how do we get really, really clear on what it is that we really, really want with our lives? See, that's the real question, right? Mm -hmm. If you think of the, the self-discipline and living aligned with your goals, again, what are your goals? If you think of the productivity, spending the time and energy and attention wisely towards your goals, that's the question. And that's why the first habit or one of the key habits in the High Performance Habits by Brendan Burchard is seeking clarity. Because to be a high performer, you need to be super clear. And I spend my days, my weeks, refining clarity, thinking, is this what I want to focus on most? Is this the right direct? What's my why? What's... And I'm retweaking it and reviewing it, even though it's similar every time. I'm constant, like, I don't know, every week, every two weeks, like super, super regularly, because 
then there's new input, then things change, then I have a sudden epiphany, then I have a conversation and all these things mean we need to gain clarity. But to come back to your question, how do we find what goals to go in? So there's a few key ways. One of them obviously is working. Hold on, can I, can I stop you for a second? I think before we have goals, we have to know what we want, right? Like, uh, what do you want your life to look like? Right? Like, do you want to be a billionaire or do you want to affect change on young people? You know, because like with the teacher and billionaire thing, billionaire hedge funds affect change on young people, teach school. So um, how do we get clear on what we want our life to look like? Or do you disagree with me? And if you disagree with me, it's totally fine. I have plenty. No, of I agree. I think first we need to know what we want. And from there, we base goals. Uh, okay. I guess when I was saying getting clear on goals, I was I meant getting clear on what you want. Okay. And I feel so there's a few different ways. Obviously, working with a, a coach or some or a really good friend that asks deep questions can help mm -hmm. you sort of elucidate that. Similarly, if you journal a lot, some things will come out. That aside, we can also look at when were the moments that felt the most aligned? When did we feel the happiest, most aligned? This is one of the tools I use most for my clarity. So I look at some days where I feel it was really aligned. You know, it just felt like such a good day and everything just felt right and balanced and good. And I analyze it. I think, what was my morning routine? How did I commute? Who did I talk to? What activities did I do? Uh, and I, I look at that. Typically, there tends to be a lot of interaction and I'm highly extroverted, so that gives me energy. And similarly, I look at days where it just felt a bit off, like a bit not aligned, maybe even a bit boring, not challenging enough. Typically for me, those are days I haven't interacted enough. So my pattern's pretty similar, <laughs> but that doesn't really indicate exactly the direction. In, in my case, for instance, that just shows I like talking to people more than doing tasks. That doesn't show you what you want, but it can help you to see what energizes you. Uh, another way to sort of see. I want to stop you right there for a second. I think this is the number one thing that people don't do is they don't analyze. They get results yes. and then they just randomly say, okay, it was, it was that. And they don't <clears throat> analyze to, to then recreate. We get so stuck in the, oh, it was good result. Good. Okay. Yay. You know, oh, result bad. Boo. And it, it takes us down this rabbit hole of like these spikes of high, very happy and low, very not happy where rather than you just take a result or a day as, as, a, as a result and look at it and go, okay, what, what, what happened? What made that a, a great day? And oh, let's do more of that. All right. And what made this a not so great day? And maybe we do a little less of that and, and, and we figure that out, we, but we're just letting these events and these days just like ricochet off. us like a ball when you're throwing it against the wall, like it means nothing. Hmm, that's a really good point. I don't actually think about that that much because <laughs> I analyze it all the time. Uh, I think about these things all the time in terms of productivity, time management, energy management. I'll, I'll do the same with my energy. When my energy is high, I'll look what were the factors, uh, how I spend my time. Uh, yeah, so I guess I do this all the time, but it's true that that was a really good point that a lot of the time people don't actually stop and pause and think, hey, why was this a good week, good month, good day? Um, and what am I enjoying? Uh, and so, yes, so that's one key thing. Another way to find <clears throat> what we really- Sorry, I have a little cold, my bad. <laughs> uh, yeah, another way to find uh, what we really want, I think is to look at what we really don't want and try and sort of pivot it on its head. So that sounds obvious, but you know, in my case, it's more like looking, okay, I don't want to feel super isolated. How do I feel super connected? Oh, okay, let me plan lunches, et cetera. And sometimes that's a really simple tool of, what we want on a daily basis, but also what we want in life. Because for a lot of people, that's how it begins. They think, well, I don't want to work in you know, an office doing this for the rest of my life. Okay, good start. But then what would it look like? Pivoted. And also maybe looking at uh, people or life stories or role models that we find really inspiring in terms of their lifestyle, not in terms of their results, not because they're a millionaire or billionaire, not because they've got X amount of bestsellers, but because you know maybe they live in Bali and looks cool or because they're traveling lots or because mm -hmm. they you know are living close to nature and so they have a house in the middle of nowhere and you have their own garden whatever it is but think okay this is inspiring in terms of lifestyle so that can be one indication of what we want and then it's what we want in terms of impact because i feel there's sort of two three key things to what we want 
One of them is lifestyle. How do we want to live our life? That's one thing. Where do we want to live? Partners, blah, blah, blah. Maybe co-living, maybe traveling the world, whatever it is. That's one, one thing that's important. It's a big part of our life. Another one is impact. Like you were saying, do we want to impact young people through teaching? Do we want to have uh, impact on a wider level intellectually or sports arena or whatever it is but what type of impact do we want to have and then another one is how do we want to learn and grow because let's say you want to have an impact on younger people and help to educate them on how to manage their emotion that's great but then maybe you really want to learn and grow on whatever marketing or creative writing i mean they can be related but you, <coughs> you're also allowed to be passionate about creative writing and writing novels and want in the impact you want on the world is helping kids to master their emotions so i feel those are really the three core topics to explore what lifestyle do you want the way you want to lead your life daily what impact you want to have on the world what difference do you want to make because i don't think we're actually fully happy if we're not contributing and then what do you really want to learn what do you want to learn and grow and develop because I think when we're understimulated and we're not learning enough, which happens a lot when we get jobs compared to when we're students, uh, we tend not to learn as much. And that's also kind of not healthy somehow yeah, intellectually. We, we give in. We give in on life. Yeah, like, it's know, kind of we know. get a bit bored, a bit blasé, you know, just watching Netflix every night when you could be picking up a hobby instead. And I feel maintaining that passion for learning, and it can be anything, you know, it can be a language, a hobby, dancing, it can be linked to your work <laughs> or not. But I think those are the three areas. So really the lifestyle, the impact and the learning and development. Yeah, it's great stuff. Um, what got you into this? Like why, like what, what, what led you here in your life? Like what was your early life like? And, uh, I know not, not too personal, right. But, um, what, what got you to wanting to do this kind of work? Yeah, that's a good point. I started my career working at sea. So I did maps of the sea floor. Uh, for one month out of two. So I was one month at sea on a boat offshore in the middle of the ocean. Okay. And then, and did you go uh, down? No, I wasn't a diver. Okay. I was uh, on the boats to, doing the maps as an engineer. And so I was doing that a month out of two and, and traveling quite a bit. And, th and that was nice. And I enjoyed it. Did you grow it. up it in Sweden? A, like all in Europe? It or? wasn't just in Sweden. It was also in Norway and UK and also went a bit to South Pacific and Fiji and New Caledonia and yeah, it was a bit of an adventure. It was in my okay. early 20s okay. and I liked it, but it wasn't what I was passionate about in terms of the actual job. I liked the traveling and being at sea, but I was really passionate about people and psychology and self-improvement. And then one day I just discovered coaching and I could never really explain it differently than I just fell in love. Literally, I fall in love twice in my life, coaching my husband, that's it, <laughs> the biggest loves of my life. And it really felt like that. It really felt like the same thing, right? The, the butterflies, the heart flashes. I was in love with coaching uh, from the pretty much the first moment I discovered it. I feel the same way. I'm a, I'm a teacher and uh, I teach martial arts and I fucking love it. Like my <clears throat> my wife can't grasp it sometimes. She's like, if, if, if we gave you a hundred million dollars, would you stop? No way. Like, no, no way. You You can't make me stop. It's like, it's the same thing with you though. But like, I like to say to a babe, like if somebody gave me a hundred million dollars to leave you, like I, I, I couldn't do it. Like, cause that, that's just not worth it to me. Like I, I'd have, what would I do? I mean, I, I'd have to do drugs and like, be miserable, <laughs> you know, because this isn't what I want with my life. You know, I'll, I'll, I'm going to go try to figure out how to make a hundred million dollars doing this. Sure. Great. Doing my thing, but there's no way I'm going to like trade one for the other. Absolutely. So what is it about it that you love so much? Like, like, what, what, like, uh, coach, what, why do you love it? Like most, some people uh, hate it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a strange idea. Uh, I think the, 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 the two main things this has come up time and time again, when I've been coached, trying to find out what I'm really, really passionate about deep down. And it really just comes out to two things, which is people and learning. Of course, I'm not passionate about learning everything, but those are the two things I enjoy most, people and learning. And coaching is that. It's, it's that in-depth interaction 
where you get to really know someone, but not just on a superficial <laughs> level, but really see, you know, what triggers them, what inspires them, what how they react, et cetera, et cetera. And you get to learn a lot about people, about yourself, the number of times clients are going through stuff. And I'm like, this is kind of what I'm going through or what I went through last month. And it's sort of like a mirror pretty much every time. It's kind of spooky. And um, yes, I just feel you learn so, so much about the human psyche and and then you see the transformation. It's like the the but caterpillar going into the butterfly. It it really is uh, quite extraordinary. And I think when I first discovered it, well, first of all, I was passionate about goals, and I discovered all about setting goals effectively. La la la. That was the beginning. But it's just one of those things, like like an onion. There's always another layer, another layer, another layer, mm-hmm, another mm-hmm. book, another concept, another tool and then it's like my mind and i think this is what happens when you get really into any field doesn't matter what field it is my mind starts to cross correlate concepts right it's like oh but if i take the enneagram and i look how this impacts self-discipline and i add focus and to see how the energy is done but wait what about the biological rhythms And, and my mind just sort of takes it all together and then formulates it into a question for the client or sees the pattern they're going through and then shifts. And I don't know, it does some really cool stuff in my head. (laughs) Yeah, I agree. I I don't get into the science of it as much. Like the science does not, uh, it doesn't really do it for me. You know, like what our brain's doing and why, like I I could like, uh, uh, okay, great. Uh, But like the, the human performance side of it, like I fucking love watching somebody like step into their power. And if I could have like this little, little, little thing that like helped them, oh my God, it's like the most amazing feeling. Like it's such a cool feeling. So, and, and they get something too. So I think one of the things that um, really bugs me with coaches sometimes is they say, oh, it's all for the clients. It's all for the clients. And that's not true, right? Like that is not true. There's a lot of narcissism in coaching. Like I, I, I personally feel amazing when my student athlete, et cetera, does really well. Definitely. Definitely. I think <laughs> it's just 50, 50. And mm-hmm. I think I'm, it, maintaining it at 50, 50 is healthy, you know, 50, but then obviously the client is getting their results, they're progressing, they're loving it. Great. But 50, but I'm super happy. Every time I hang out from a call, I get inspired from my clients. I have some clients that, you know, get up at 5 a.m. in the U.S. to do a coaching session and they, you know, exercise a ton every day. So I'm like, man, this client is really high level. I have to maintain my stuff, you know? So Mm -hmm. I get inspired by my clients. I learn through them. And yes, definitely, I'd say it's 50-50 and no way is it. I don't think we ever do something only for the other person because even an act of just kindness, helping someone to cross the street, we get an oxytocin boost mm-hmm. it's in our body. We get something mm-hmm. out of it and that's fine. It doesn't make the act less good or less kind. It's just we're wired to be kind and it's a good thing. It's encouraged us to do it more. <laughs> How do you, uh, okay, hold on. I'll come back to that question. I won't forget it. Um, what was it like completely switching fields? Because like you're on the ocean, you're making maps of the sea floor. It has nothing to do with this self-discipline and and mindful self-discipline and focus and coaching like they couldn't be farther apart one you're just doing this task right and the other one is you know coaching and helping and all this like they're not related at all so what was the process like for you to switch from one field to another yeah i think Oh, first of all, I think that they're a bit related in the sense that the engineering mindset and brain goes quite well with the analytical skills of uh, coaching. So it has helped me in that perspective. And of course, the the resilience I built up from uh, working at sea meant that I had quite a bit of human experience, if that makes any sense. When I when I began in sort of my mid to late 20s, I feel that those years of working night shifts, of managing a team on a boat, of being remote, of uh, you know, all the sort of stuff I lived at sea, I think uh, really helped me in many ways. Um, but so that aside, what was it like? Um, I think it was very difficult from a identity perspective because I grew up in France and in France being an engineer is kind of like a, you know, a cool thing, <laughs> like doctors and uh, mm-hmm. uh, lawyers or whatever in India. And I wasn't that attached to it particularly, but on the moment when I felt like leaving, I remember having all these fears of the people I knew and my engineering school and my teachers and all of this um, 
yeah, I felt really afraid of the judgment and the that people wouldn't understand it, that, you know, coaching would be seen as flaky when I come from a scientific field. I was very lucky that both my husband and my parents fully supported me. So from a family perspective, that was fine. But it's true that from friends and colleagues, and that was really hard, a lot harder than I thought it would be. But once I'd done that, it felt like, why did I ever worry? <laughs> Like the it's always people, like that, right? It's, yeah, always, it's always like, like that. that. Like people mm -hmm. were super supportive. That most of them were envious that A, I'd found something I was so passionate about, and B, that I had the guts to do it. Either they also wanted to leave but didn't know to do what, or they knew what they wanted to do but didn't have the courage to do it. So most of them were actually pretty envious. And then uh one or two didn't really get it or support it, but not many. And then that really didn't matter so much. So yeah. And then I think, okay, yeah, to continue the transition bit. So that was sort of my fear. And that got was it it's just a switch? Like all of a sudden you did this, like you stopped one, did the other, or was it a slow burn? No, I'm not really a slow burn person. <laughs> I got girl. into it. Uh, yeah, I, I started studying coaching <laughs> and like three, four months in, I just left and quit my job and I was still studying and I hadn't got finished it. and I just did it all on. And um, yeah. And I think the second <clears throat> thing that was really hard uh, wasn't so much the identity shift, but I totally underestimated having a business full stop. And so I thought, well, I learned coaching. I'll just coach a few people, get 20 clients a month, charge this much. That's it. Right. And so I'd learned coaching and I was doing well with the clients I had for free and getting results and enjoying it. And I just thought, well, and that's it. <laughs> I had no business plan. I had no marketing skills. I didn't know how to sell. Uh, I literally, after I quit, set up a website and printed some business cards. And I was like, right, I'm ready. I'm done. <laughs> so, <laughs> and at the beginning, what I did was sort of sell offline at like running clubs or Toastmasters. And it was okay, but obviously I wasn't bringing in 20 clients a month. And then that was a really steep learning curve. Like I learned so much, both in terms of marketing, branding, sales, business, finance, you name it but also in terms of resilience and perseverance and patience. And that was a very tough switch that I think I totally underestimated because I had an engineering background. So I knew nothing, literally. I mean, when I say nothing, I didn't even know the term SEO. I didn't know like a CRM, like I knew nothing in business. Yeah. So that was tough. I, but I remember the fun. same for me. I was an athlete, you know, I was, I was a pro fighter for 10 years. Uh, and like when I bought into the schools, I like was like, hey, we need to, you know, I was talking to some people. I was like, we need to hire an SEO person. And he goes, do you even know what SEO means? And I was like, <laughs> uh, no, but I read it. You know, he's like, how about you go learn a little, you know, so that you can then hire the right person. And I was like, oh, that's a really great idea. And uh, yeah, it's it's just such an interesting thing, this being in business for yourself or being being a business person. Uh you have so much to learn. And then, but once you learn it, then you can feel like you can just replicate it, right? Because you just, like the task of the business is just, that's just the business. That's like, oh, okay, great. We'll, we'll find somebody to do that. But these other skills, these are the real skills that really like make the business go. So it's a very interesting thing, uh, learning how to do a business, quote unquote. Yes, it is. And and obviously I'm still learning and growing. Yeah, I suck at day. it. I mean, we all are. Yeah. <laughs> And the world is always changing. So it's suddenly like, uh, yeah, things shift anyway. But I do feel when I look back that I was extremely naive, but I think it was a good thing because it helped me to take that jump. But I also see things in a very different light. Mm -hmm. And I feel, yeah, it's changed me a lot tremendously. So, it's yeah. always changing and you can't figure out, sometimes you get success and you can't figure out what you did, right? Like, like I have a post right now, it's going viral, like full viral, almost 5 million views, wow. which is crazy, <laughs> crazy, right? Crazy. And like, it happened all of a sudden. And I'm like, okay, what the fuck did I do? Like, I got to try to do this again. <laughs> you know, like I'm lit, like, I'm like, what was it, it about? Uh, it was about a fight. You know, it was a guy getting knocked out at, at uh, the pound for pound King uh, who, you know, pound for pound means pound for pound means if you it's, it's a, uh, it's a term that we use like, okay, all of the champions in the world, but it's weight classed. If you were to like take the weight away, who's the best, who has the best skills, right? And we'll never know this. It's only like an idea in our head, right? Because they'll never actually fight. So there's, there's this one guy named Kamara Usman who has never lost in the UFC. And he was smashing this guy in another title fight. 
And then in the last minute, this guy throws a head kick, boom, knocks him out cold, you know, out cold. Uh, and it's, it's the image of the knockout, right? The video of the knockout. And behind it, I have, I took Yoda's voice and uh, uh, do or do not, there is no try, right? And there's a little music to it. And it went fucking like, like literally I'm up like thousands of followers. Uh, and it's a hunt, like I'm almost at 5 million views. And I'm like, God damn. And then I'm like trying to recreate it to see if I can do it again. I think I just got, what happened was somebody famous, really famous, probably shared it. And then it went nuts. Right. So, uh, but yeah, it's like this, this replication, like you have success and you're like, okay, do that again. But in business, sometimes you just had success. You don't even know how you did it. Like, I hate this kind of success because I don't know how to do it. <laughs> like, don't, okay. I shouldn't say I hate it. It's fun. It's fun to watch the out, like, cause you always hear about the algorithm. Right. But has the algorithm ever worked in your favor? It's the first time it's worked in mine. So you're, you know, I'm like, what the fuck? Fuck you, the algorithm. And now I'm like, oh my God, the, the internet is really crazy. But how to catch it again is, is, is a question. Yes. Well, I think sometimes we shouldn't worry too much about replicating things when they, they, they go well, although it's good to, you know, get inspiration and maybe it mm -hmm. can give you the next thing. But I, I often feel that sometimes when we're just doing things from a really aligned way and super inspired and we're really in it, somehow it resonates. Maybe not 5 million views, right? But the posts are sure, the best sure. are the ones I just write in one flow and I'm really like, you know, tapping into something. And I feel that that's what matters most. And same with getting business clients and stuff. It tends to be in those moments <clears> where you just feel super aligned, super on, super connected somehow. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we need to replicate. I don't think it's, the individual post, we need to replicate that feeling of feeling. super connected, super aligned, super inspired, super on. And the when we're off, don't do it. You know, when you're not feeling it, don't write a post, don't do that call. Just, or, or if you have to do the call and it's planned, then find a way to re sort of connect yourself in a good way somehow. That's a really great point. Um, well, my other question that I told you I was going to wait on for a second was a lot of times with this coaching thing, right? Like life coaching. I hate that term life coaching just because, uh, I don't have my life really figured out, I guess. Like, like it works. For yeah. Me. I never call it life coaching. Yeah, I always not, have a yeah. leadership coach, but I could right. say focus coach, discipline coach, sure. whatever coach, but it does get lumped into this lifestyle, you know? Um, excuse me. How do you not come off? Like you have all the answers. And I think, cause I think sometimes this is where it gets a bad rap, right? It's like, Oh, how are you going to tell someone what to do? Right. Like things like that. So how, how do you how do you make sure that it's not like this is the answer when you're helping, talking, expressing your point, making a post right to try to market in a way. But because you but when you do it, you still have to convince them that you do have some answers. Right. you got to have some answers for people's questions, but not be arrogant and conceited about it. Yeah, it's a tough one. And I think it's also yeah. the, the sort of uh, the balance between coaching and mentoring. Um, I generally enjoy coaching more, which is where I help people find to their own answer. Uh, this makes more sense when it's something <clears> like they're hesitating between two decisions or they're unsure about the next step. Then it makes sense to question them, what feels right, la, 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 la. That bit I enjoy more. But it's true that when it comes to focus and discipline, because obviously I've studied it a lot and I've read a lot about it and I've written a lot about it, then they might be like, okay, how do I overcome procrastination? How do I do this? Blah, blah, blah. Then I try and do a mix. So I might say, look, you know, this is a common tool you can use. This is something that could be useful. I know what's worked for me is X. I know what worked for this client is Z. But then I also might do a mix of, you know, in the past, when you felt like procrastinating and you suddenly took action, what did you do differently then? Or how did you used to manage your distraction? Or on that day, you were super focused. What was your strategy? Well, I actually, you know, use this tool or, or I remember I went for a few walks. Great you know, you have the answer. So I, I generally try and do a mix because obviously in the fields where I've written and researched and, and looked it up a lot, then it makes sense to give some input. But I also don't want to be exactly just that conceited, arrogant person, just because I know a bit this stuff doesn't mean it'll work for them. So it's more like, hey, how do you feel about this, this, and this? And sometimes it's a mix. So I'll give an idea a strategy and they say, oh, I could do this and this, or I could do this with this twist. And then it's sort of a mix of their sort of what I said, inspired them a bit. And then they completed the solution. It's a great answer because a lot of times uh, when you 
where I or anybody tells someone to do something, uh, it's like forcing the water down their throat, right? And nobody enjoys that water. But when it's this thing where it's like, oh, okay, like you kind of like hid the water there. And then they come upon it when they're thirsty. They're like, oh shit, look what, you know, and they feel very empowered. So it's a hard thing. You know, it's a hard thing. There's a lot of failure to it. I know for me, there's been a lot of failure to it. Um, you know, just, I'm a, yeah, like you mess it up sometimes and, and, and then you just got to go back and do it again. So, uh, last question here as, as we close up, normally I ask the, why did you come on the podcasting? But we did that on the front end because you asked me, um, I believe everyone has a unique and special power, right? Something that makes them amazing. Uh, and they go and then give that to the world. And then the world then returns to them, you know, well, you know, LeBron James case, for example, fame and money, you know, and then something, then he gets to keep giving his power to the world and basketball or yada, yada. Right. What, what is your power? What's your superpower? I think it's enthusiasm. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Explain uh, I, I I feel super enthusiastically about things and super passionately about things and about all these topics on living with intention and, you know, mastering yourself and self-discipline and all these things. And I feel that it's probably a combination of sort of genuine joy and enthusiasm for the, this topic that I want to sort of share and give to the world combined with a sort of uh, inner clarity. So I feel and hopefully that was the case in today's podcast that I can express these ideas quite clearly and they're quite clear in my mind. So then I feel that this combination of sort of enthusiasm and joy and energy with that sort of inner clarity makes it easy to sort of deliver messages, which is why I love podcast interviews, speaking interviews, um, but also coaching because there's an inner clarity to questions and kind of a energy and a presence also to get people uplifted and motivated. So I feel those are my... Um, yeah, superpowers, I think. I think it's a very hard thing to be clear, right? You know, in, in your ideas, because we ideas ideas can be muddled and muddy and and, and difficult. And uh, everyone thinks they have good ones. And, and maybe we all do. I think the real difference is like somebody like Neil deGrasse Tyson, for example. We know astrophysics and, and all that stuff is really, really difficult. But he explains it to us in a way we're like, yo, I got that. You know, so I think, I think you did a great job with it. I asked very specific, difficult questions. I, I felt like, like values, discipline, all these things. And you were just like, boop, boop, boop. Like, and it wasn't like, like you, you did it great. So yeah, I really enjoyed uh, your answers. So uh, thank, thank you so you. much for coming on. Tell everyone if they're interested, where they can find you, your social media and all that stuff. Yeah. Thank you so much, Elia. Really enjoyed being on the show today. So you can find me at thefocusb.com. That's my website or at Katie Stoddard at LinkedIn. And for anyone who is listening to the podcast, I know you have very few listeners, but if ever <laughs> you are, I'd be happy to give you a sort of free focus order to see where you are in terms of focus, what you can improve with that inner clarity and in like a 30 minute call. So feel free to write to me on LinkedIn. Just put the name of the podcast. Might be the blueprint by then or the gospel of fire. Yeah, we'll, we'll uh, figure it out which one it is. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd be happy to give you a 30 minute call. But yes, I enjoyed uh, the um, question so much. I really enjoyed the conversation. So thank you so much for having me. Katie, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate you reaching out. I, uh, I really enjoy podcasting just because for this reason, right? <clears throat> um, you get to meet people, you get to hear different ideas. Just like you said, like I get to take some stuff like, oh, I really liked what she said there. I'm going to use that. Right. Um, and then just just the 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 connection like so for me you mentioned my things behind me the martin luther king quote in general the the that one for me is connection okay i i like to feel connected it's not so much compassion like i'm kind of a compassionate person but i'm not the most compassionate person um for me love connects us you know and and that is what it uh that's what it really comes down to for me so so that's um, one of your values connection love connection. it yeah amazing connection's one of my values yes Amazing. So, but anyway, thanks for coming on. Thanks for reaching out. And everybody, as always, Katie has her unique and special power that she goes out and she gives to the world. And I have my unique and special power that I do the same with. Please don't go out in the world and try to be Katie. And please don't go out in the world and try to be me. Go out there and find your own power, everyone. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Gospel of Fire. If you enjoyed the episode, I'd love a review on iTunes or wherever you are listening to this podcast. Don't forget to follow me on social media at FireMarshall205. 
If you are a BJJ enthusiast, check out my YouTube channel. I put all kinds of instructional DVD uh, videos out on there, so go check it out. My book is still out on Amazon by the same name as the podcast, The Gospel of Fire. So if you are interested, go check out that. And most importantly, guys, go out there every day, find your power. Thanks a lot. Guys, look, I get it. I totally get it. You opened a martial arts school, and man, it's kind of crushing you. There's all this other stuff to do other than teach, right? You love teaching. You love jujitsu. You love Muay Thai. You love karate, whatever it is you're, you're teaching. And man, but there's all this other stuff. There's, there's the front desk. There's, there's taxes. There's curriculum. There's cleaning. There's, there's problems, staffing, covering. Whew, man, it's so much. It's so much. Well, let me tell you, uh, we have started what's called Easton Online. And Easton Online is here to solve all of these problems for you. Easton Online is a digital academy for martial arts school owners and managers. will help you establish or enhance your business with best practices. Most importantly, we're going to help you get back to what it is that you love most, teaching and doing martial arts. Okay, so for more information, guys, go to easton.online. Again, that's easton.online. Add your email. You're going to get notified about the course launches. Our first course is going to be all about the first impression specialists, your front desk, and all kinds of stuff, special offers, promotions, as well as we started a podcast by the same name, Easton Online, that's going to talk about our process of how how we went from a tiny little martial arts school to what is now seven martial arts schools, seven Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Muay Thai schools um, in a very holistic way that we believe um, kept the integrity of the art and also deals with its people very well. So again, easton.online, enter your email, and you're going to get all you're going to get everything you need right there so thanks guys